I will, I'll speak about uh, this morning about essentially optimization of deep networks, especially under the square loss. Um, this afternoon, I'll speak about a higher level topic, which is the representational power of deep networks, especially convolutional networks and uh, tra potentially transformers and MLP um, mixers, why they work as well as they do, okay? Of course, uh, you probably all know um, there is this, uh, you know, puzzle that was perhaps emphasized even too much, but it's still quite interesting about uh, um, deep networks typically being used, trained with many more parameters than data. Um, this is something that started with uh, um, convolutional network, uh, um, first with ImageNet, um, and has continued with these more recent architectures like transformers. And uh, so one can ask immediately, um, how is that supposed to work in terms of generalization, in terms of predicting new data. And the reason I say that is because when a very long time ago I was uh, studying physics in the classes on uh, experimental physics, I think it was called the lab of f uh, physics lab or something, one of the first things we were taught was that if we have a model of a physical process um, which has 10 parameters or so, and we want to fit the parameters from data, uh, you, may, you better have, you know, not 10, but 20 times as many data points. 100 would be even better. And now it seems that the receipt, what, you know, the field of deep networks is telling you is the opposite. Use many more parameters than data, and things will be fine. Okay, so keep this in mind. This seems contrary to everything that was taught until now, and uh, I'll come back to that later. You all know the deep networks, many layers, um, typically um, the last layer just before the classifier is just a linear layer, in the layers before, you have a number of units, uh, like this one, and what each unit is doing is taking the sum of its inputs, weighted by certain weights, takes this sum, the output is a number, and then the number is passed through this simple nonlinearity. So if the sum if this number is larger than zero, it remains the same. If it's smaller than zero, it will be set to zero, okay? Um, now and in the following, I'm uh, forgetting biases. So I have only weights, no biases. The reason for that is just to simplify the mathematics. Empirically, networks basically work in the same way with or without bias, especially if you take care to have in the first layer one of the uh, input of the vector x will be a constant, like one, okay? The key part, of course, in uh, uh, this is uh, that um, um, you have to find this weights, w. I have a matrix of weights, uh, call it typically W, for instance, W1 will be the matrix of weights in the first layer, WL will be the matrix in the last layer. Notice that in the last layer I don't have this RLU nonlinearity after the linear operation performed by the weights. Um, so my network is defined in this way, yes a function of an input g, uh, of the input x, a function g of an input x, um, parameterized by a set of weights, uh, actually a, 
uh, number of matrices, L matrices, from 1 to L, where L are the number of layers in this deep network, okay? The key here is, of course, how do I find these weights? And uh, um, for instance, in ImageNet, in, uh, you have uh, a training set, which is essentially one million images. Um, it's 1,000 different classes, about 1,000 images per class. And you have, depending on the specific network you are using, there are some of different architectures, but you may have 10 million parameters or more. Okay? So you have a lot of parameters to set. How do you do that? Well, that's what happens during training. During training, you are looking for the value of the parameters W that minimize a loss function. And the loss function is the sum of um, the discrepancy between the true label of the input, uh, the true output, and what your network produces. So you are trying to find the weights that minimize this loss, okay? And the loss function itself could be, if you are in the case of binary classification, the output is plus one, minus one, you could use a logistic. If you are in the case of regression, you can use the square loss, in which case I would have Square loss, I would have yi, this is the true label, plus one or minus one, for instance, minus f of xi, w, and to the square, right? And I have the sum of this over all the data points. Um, the loss function that has been mostly used in the past for classification task anyway is cross entropy, which is the generalization to multi class of the logistic. I will focus mainly on the square loss uh, because recently it has been shown that it works very well empirically and it's simpler in terms of theory. Um, the way to minimize this is, you know, the kind of dumbest thing you can do is gradient descent. So we are looking for the gradient so this would be minus dl dw, where l is the total loss. Um, for instance, you have each weight. You can do this for each. You should do this for each weight. ij, layer i, and uh, j unit. Um, this will be also um, essentially the grade will be minus dl dw ij would be the time derivative of uh, w ij. Okay, that's um, what the gradient descent is. Now, typically, you don't use, uh, for computational reason, um, gradient descent in which you take the sum over all training data, but what you do, you do the same thing, but instead of a sum over all training data, you have the sum over a smaller number of training data, a mini batch, and this mini batch is a subset of the training data that is taken randomly, IID, at every iteration, okay? If the mini batch size is Capital N, the, how many the training data are, then it's equivalent to gradient descent. If uh, you can com even consider the opposite, the ex other extreme, in which you take the mini batch size one, and then at every iteration, you just do this operation, but just on one I. There is no sum. And the one I is chosen random. Okay, um, you know, the, the rather in, um, at least superficially uh, surprising things for many people is that if you do that, 
um, things actually work. And the reason it's surprising is because, in general, because of the nonlinearities in the network, you know, with, without the RLU, if you take the RLU out, that would be what to expect. It should, should work, no problem. But with nonlinearities, in this case the RLU at several stages, um, you, what you expect in general is the loss function would be complicated with several minima and maxima and saddle points, and you are in, uh, you know, in uh, 10 million dimensional space. So this two-dimensional picture is very misleading. You are in a very high dimensional space. But, uh, but despite that, things seem to work pretty well. You seem to converge to um, very good minima. Typically, you can converge to zero of the loss, which means you are fitting the data if you are in the square loss case. Think about it. Is f of xi minus yi squared the sum over i? That's zero. So it means f xi equal yi. I use the square loss. So the first thing to say this is a, an interesting, not well known result, but that if you have the square loss, you have uh, a network which is a deep network. So. RLU in the assumption for this theorem, um, the assumptions are that the RLU is actually smoothed, it's not discontinuous, but it's, it's uh, almost certainly just a technical point. And um, the theorem basically said that um, um, there are global minima, which means in the square loss case, the loss equals zero. And this global minima are degenerate, which means they are not isolated point in, param in the where in the space of weights, but are like manifolds, surfaces, with high dimensionality, because the dimensionality of this uh, manifolds will be, um, um, yeah, this, I'm sorry for, this should be, if D is the, the number of parameters and then the data is D minus N, okay? So, the dimensionality of these zeros. And I give you an intuition, this is basic. The, the proof is based on topological arguments. Um, but I can give you a simple version of it. Um, suppose you do the following, and we have done it. You take a deep network, and you replace every single RLU in the network with a univariate polynomial, a polynomial you know, in, in principle, it could be as simple as x squared minus x or something like this. In this case, or a polynomial eight degrees or so in one variable that approximates the RLU over a finite interval. Okay. And then you run the network, and you see that the network behaves essentially exactly as with the RLU. That's empirical, okay? Not surprising because this polynomial is very similar to the RLU. Okay, but now think about it. Your polynomial, uh, here is f of x i, is, uh, sorry, your network, f of x i, now in which where I replaced every RLU with a univariate polynomial. Now my network is a polynomial in X and W, possibly a very high degree in, the, in many variables, which are the XI, the component of X. So I have a polynomial. Now there is... <clears throat> uh, 
a theorem called Bezu theorem. Um, it's an old one in algebraic geometry about zeros of polynomials. You know, you set a polynomial equal to zero, how many, it's a very old problem since the Greeks, how many roots you find, how many solution of the equations. And Bezout theorem tells, it's essentially a generalization of the, what is it, the fundamental theorem of algebra, you know, typically you have a set of linear equation and uh, the, you have a set of linear equation in the, uh, suppose you have, uh, um, you know, n equations and you have d unknowns. If d is larger than n, if you have more unknowns than equations, you can find an infinite number of solutions. So the solution will be typically degenerate. Bezout theorem says the same is true for polynomials. So it says that if you have a polynomial, um, you have, uh, you know, n polynomial equation, you have, you know, d unknowns, these are our weights, then if W is much larger than N, you expect a lot of solutions. And typically, um, the degeneracy of this solution, so the dimensionality of this solution, is W minus N, typically. So this is it's pretty clear. Uh, you can make also the additional point, and this is something that, if anybody is interested, is uh, an open problem is look at what happens if instead of the minima of the um, of the the zero of the of those equations, I'm looking at the zero of the gradient. Okay, so this is what what the gradient descent does, right? It's looking for the zero of the of the gradient. Now, in this case, I'm looking for the zero of the gradient, and so I have as many equations as I have weights. So in this case, I have, you know, if the dimensionality of the weights is D, so here is W, capital W, but anyway, I have D equation in D unknowns. So, just superficially, this is soft algebraic geometry, it seems that um, the zero of the gradient, the system of equation that defines the zero of the gradients, are less degenerate than the zero of the function, okay? Now, of course, the solution of the first one, of the top one, are a subset of the solution of the second one. Because when you have fxi equal zero, you, uh, equal y, you'll satisfy the second equation, right? Because the second equation will be, if you, if you take derivatives, it will be f of xi minus yi times the derivative with respect w of f. It's a bit complicated because the structure of a gradient is um, it's not just an arbitrary equation. Um, there are some substructure. So, um, so I cannot tell you uh, exactly something precise about the second set of equations, okay? But the first one is clear. And the intuition that the, the local minima that are not global minima are less degenerate is also clear. That's what that says. Yeah. Sorry? Is there any particular assumption on the form of F? It depends on the... Is there correct? So the statement is agnostic to the functional form of F. This is, this is for when F is a polynomial. Yeah. So it's, uh, remember, I replaced the RLU with, with a polynomial. So, yeah. This is strictly correct for when f is a polynomial. 
I'm relatively sure that, you know, you could say, okay, I can approximate the RLU with a polynomial and then carry on this argument, but it may not work. You know, I, that, that has not been done. I'm sorry? Because the only other concern would be the partial derivative. With the RLU, here I'm assuming it's a polynomial, so, but yeah, I, I can show you there is one, um, one condition that you can use with RLU that's actually interest for the derivatives. But, um, okay, there are some very interesting um, comments, not, not on neural networks, but related to, to the Bezout theorem by Terry Tao, you know, the well-known mathematicians. You can see, look at his blob about this kind of consideration about the generous. Uh, uh, comment that, um, why can't the manifolds of the zero be separated? I think you had a reference to the 2019 paper by Nikuyan saying that, that they're all connected. Yes, um, I'm, I'm going to do... They should be connected. Why, why can't you have... Here we are saying there are global minima, uh, actually. But not like in, in general. Uh, uh, yeah. Okay, the yes. So the, there is a, a result, um, there is paper by Ningui, in which if you have a, um, a special kind, not, not very special, kind of parameter um, of um, over parameterization in the weights. So, um, I think the weights of the first layer, the number of weights have to be larger than the data points by themselves, not only the total number of weights. And then uh, I think the number of weights has to decrease layer per layer. There, there are some conditions of this type. Uh, then um, the global minima are all connected. Empirically, people have found evidence for um, minima being connected. Um, now, this does not necessarily, you have to think about, you are in a big dimensional space, so a global minima could be connected and still do very strange thing in principle. But, but anyway, yes. This is, uh, um, let's see, the, the, the Yaim Cooper, Theorem is for square loss. Um, this result here, I think also, but I'm not sure. I have to check. Here, um, it's just a point um, about. So this is this is a bit waving my hands. It's not exactly correct. Um, but I can state something that is actually exactly correct, which is, so now consider uh, the neural network. We don't need to consider a polynomial anymore. And um, the gradient equation um, is like df. So this, this would be my, uh, I'm sorry for, switching notation, f would be like the w. Um, and, uh, and so the, I have a gradient equation. And then I can represent the, um, the effect of picking a different mini batch every time by a noise term. And I can argue that this noise term, because of the central limit theorem, is similar to a Gaussian noise. This is waving my hands, okay? If it is, um, if it is, if you assume that's true, then this is a stochastic differential equation, 
and this white noise, this uh, noise term would be like a derivative of the Brownian motion. And then we know that equations of this type um, have an asymptotic solution in terms of a probability distribution. It's a stochastic differential equation, so I cannot really tell you W equal, but the probability of W. And, and this is the Boltzmann distribution for time going to infinity at equilibrium. That means that the probability distribution will be the exponential of minus the loss function divided by some, um, here would be in the Boltzmann distribution case would be temperature, um, this would correspond to the power of the noise. Now, as I said, this is not correct strictly because this random effect of, of picking a mini batch is not exactly um, Gaussian noise. I can tell you more about it if you are interested. But what this result is still correct if you assume that when you are doing gradient descent, you can do your mini batch and so on but you are adding a little bit of Gaussian white noise. And we've done that experimentally. Things don't change, or if, if at all, they seem to improve in the small number of experiments we did. If, we do, if you do that, then this is correct. There are other ways to deal with, um, with the noise, there are papers looking at it. There is a recent one of, um, let me see, what is his name? It's, I think it was a student in the summer school. This is a paper with Surya Gangul. It's a quite nice one. I'll come back to that later. I'll tell you the reference. Anyway, that's, um, why do I want to say that? It's because of the following thing. Um, suppose you are doing um, you, have, uh, you have a loss function, uh, is a, like an energy potential, which is like this in two dimensions. So you, this loss function has one localized minimum and another one which is equally deep but degenerate. In, just co-dimensionality one, so it's not very degenerate. But. Okay, so you can kind of see what will happen is that if you, if you look at the Boltzmann distribution of a diffusive process, like, you know, suppose diffusion or heat, heat in, a, in a potential of this type, you'd expect something like that. Right? So in other words, in other words, you will see much, you know, despite the fact that they are equally deep, there will be um, more volume in the degenerate minimum for the probability distribution than in the other one. Because it's much more likely for particles diffusing to end up in the um, minimum which is the generate has a largest larger volume and so you can see in fact this is an, an interesting effect of dimensionality if you do this in one dimension so instead of two is one dimension you get this this is the asymptotic probability distribution when you do it in two dimension the difference is larger when you do it in five dimension the, you don't see at all the, this minimum. Yeah. There are global minima, there are global minima, the probability to end up if you have 
you know, stochastic Brownian motion, so it's like, you know, a particles under Brownian motion. This is the probability of ending up. But, but I'm just saying that volumes are more general than that. This is a local minimum, right? Well, I mean, um, they are both reaching zero, right? But one is degenerate, the other one is not. What I'm saying is that you know, Oh, no, 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 that's exactly the point. They depend on the degeneracy. So, you know, on the volume of, yes, they basically, yes, thank you. They don't, the depth does not matter. It, it, it depends the volume of, uh, in, in a, a parameter space. So what, what this says is that if I have a lot of overparameterization, since I know that the global minim the global, I mean, the zero loss minima are very degenerate, I would expect to end up there most of the time. If the local minima are less degenerate, forget how deep they are, they, you will almost never end up there. But is it just a amount of dependency? Or is, uh, for example, the shape of the I think you're right that the shape matters too, but the dimensionality matters a lot because the volume is huge, right? If you have one being more degenerate than another one. And, and I think also related to this, uh, yeah, I guess you're doing and in any point, but. Well, not only this, I, I have also um, the assumption of Brownian motion, right? So there is a, um, say a white noise type um, thing acting on, uh, on, uh, on, my, uh, on, my mi on my minimizer. But, but what I'm thinking now, I'm thinking networks, how all these I'll tell you more about me. This is to give some intuition. As I said, this was waving my hands, but to give you some intuition why it's actually good to have overparameterization, because the optimization is easier. And the optimization is easier means that if the zero loss minima, the one you are interested, because they are the one the best you know, the, the best minimizers, if those turn out to be the most degenerate, and the most degenerate turns out to be the most likely you hit in a process of this type. So that, that's the kind of intuition I wanted to give. It's, as I said, it's not precise, but the rest will be more, much more precise. So um, 
let me skip this for a moment and me, let me, okay, um, look at, uh, again, deep networks. Uh, now I'll be more precise. Again, is what I showed before. So a deep network um, would be a, I don't have biases. So I have a matrix of weights. Um, RLUs, matrix of weights, RLUs, and the last layer, WL, is just linear. Okay, then I look at the square loss, um, which strictly speaking is this, and I look at binary classification. Okay, just for simplification. This can be extended to multi-class. What I want to think about is that I want to think of the network as a network F where the weight matrix are normalized. They have each one Frobenius norm one, apart the last one. And rho is the product of the norms before normalization of each layer. This actually should be L minus one. But this is Frobenius norm. You know what it is? So it's a sum of the squares of each element in the matrix. I also assume that my input vector has been normalized. This is often done, can be done anyway, so the norm is one. But let's, again, you, you will see that f of x will be less than one because the norm of the product of these matrices is less than one because each one is at most one. This is what I want to think I would like to do. Um, the reason is that uh, there are some interesting properties. If I do that, then f of x free, you know, say um, that free is not a component, is the example number free. Um, that would be, that value would be the margin of that example. I'm defining the margin probably here. Okay, the margin um, is uh, um, you know, the somewhat slightly different definition, but yn, f of xn, is the margin of a, the um, example xn. Suppose it, it, you're, it, it has the correct sign, f of xn. So, for instance, if yn is, is plus 1, correct sign means f of xn is positive. If yn is minus 1, f of xn should be negative. So, yn times f of xn if you are correct, should always be positive. And that value, yn times f of xn, where f is normalized in that sense, is the margin of that example. Basically, it tells you how far away you are from zero, so from the classification boundary. So it's, you know, it's a definition a bit different from margin in support vector machines, where we have a more geometric definition. This is the definition in terms of the function. Okay, but let's go to the next step. Um, so um, I assume to have over parameterization, so the number of weights in each layer is so that the sum of all the number of all weights is much larger than the number of data points. Um, and as I said, I'm using square laws, uh, 
One reason is, uh, that's actually a kind of interesting story. People have been mostly using cross-entropy for multi-classification, the logistic, which makes sense for, for classification. Square loss does not really make too much sense for classification. But, you know, many years ago, probably, I don't know, 20 years ago, a student of mine, who is now at Google, um, Ryan Rifkin, did this thesis comparing um, different type of loss functions for support vector machines. And this was mostly empirical work, and uh, he showed that square loss was as good as logistic or cross entropy. You know, for some specific data set, one was better than the other, maybe. On the whole, they were essentially equivalent. Okay, this was an interesting lesson. Um, and a year ago, there was a paper by Leek and, uh, um, and Misha Belkin, in which they did experiments with different architecture and a lot of different data set using the square laws instead of a cross entropy. All of these were multi-class classification, CIFAR, ImageNet, and so on and so forth. And they found that square loss was as good, if not better, than cross entropy for classification. So that's, you know, the motivation behind using this. Um, but you can you essentially get very, not exactly the same, but very similar result if you look at cross entropy or a, a proxy for cross entropy, which would be like the exponential. One way to, um, you know, people do normali normalize the weights during uh, training. Um, I mean, a standard, there are a couple of standard things in, uh, in present day optimization of, uh, you know, deep networks, convolutional networks type. One is uh, a small amount of regularization called weight decay. And the other one, more important, is batch normalization. Okay, so batch normalization does something like um, trying to normalize the activity of the units at each layer. Now, what I'm showing you is, is theoretically how to model this. And this is a toy model. I'm not sure it, it's certainly not an exact model of what batch normalization does. But um, it's saying, OK, I'll normalize the weights. I, I don't start with the weight normalized. I normalize the weights using a Lagrange multiplier term. This is this new sum of over k of vk squared. And then I have my lambda rho square, which is the weight decay. This particular case, I. I can, so my loss function, instead of being just this, becomes this to model more accurately what people are actually doing. So this part would be modeling the batch normalization or weight normalization. As I said, it's not exactly the same because Batch normalization normalizes the units activities at each layer. This one normalizes the weights. The effect is this is certainly the same. Is that uh, the dot product w x um, for each unit will remain constant if you change the norm of the input. So, you, so what is called scale invariance. Okay, um, for this particular use of um, Lagrange multiplier, it's easy to see, and I can show you a small derivation, that in order to have this, which is what we want, so we start with VK that have, don't have norm one, if you minimize this. But then through the 
this loss function, the weights will be forced to become one. In order to do that, you can do some algebra and find out that the value of this new is this one shown here, where fn, by the way, is f of xn, and xn is the uh, vector of inputs in the example n. Okay, so, and here again, a typo because this should, uh, typically people normalize to batch normalization on the first L minus, L minus one layer and the last layer does not have batch normalization. Just thinking about it, it's back to this f of xn, so the value that is, if you are really in the zero loss minimum, you should have a row of f xn equal yn, and yn could be plus one or minus one, right? So rho of f of xn should be, say, one. Now, you could have a big rho, small f of xn, or, you know, small rho and relatively big up to one of f xn. So if, what, if fn is close to one, that means large margin. So large margin, small rho. Small margin, large rho, so to speak. You see this? Okay. These are just remarks. What I want to do is now compute the dynamics, what happens during training with this loss function that I showed before. And uh, what happens is if you take derivatives, so rho dot is the time derivative of rho, this would be minus dl d rho, and uh, v dot, the time derivative of vk, the matrix vk, and uh, you end up with these equations. Again, let me look at them. The simpler one is the rho dot equation. Um, the v dot equation is quite simple for the last layer, is this one. For the intermediate layers, you have these two terms, and this is really related to the, to the loss. If you had lambda equal zero, you'd expect rho fn equal yn, and so this term would be zero for all, all data points when you interpolate. This term here is basically a term that comes from the normalization. It will be zero when we are normalizing, exactly, just to give some intuition. You can look at equilibrium values. This would be, um, there is the following consideration that for each row, you expect to have at least a minimum and a maximum of v dot. So critical points, v dot equals zero, because v dot is defined, is normalized, right? So it's on a compact domain. And so we know that a function in a compact domain will have at least one minimum and one maximum. So for each value of rho, you have critical point of v dot. We're looking for the equilibria, which means rho dot equals zero, v dot, vk dot, all equals zero. So the key part is to see what are the equilibria for rho dot. When is rho dot equals zero? And those, those values are given here. What does that mean? It means that I'm starting from very small, um, suppose a small fn, and suppose that at some point this is positive. This is the average margin. Say, all the margins are positive means all the yn fn 
are positive, which means this would be positive. This would be, essentially you are saying, early on, during training, I have correct classification. Does not mean you have the best value by far, but actually it happens quite, on, on data set like CIFAR, it happens quite quickly that you have correct classification early on. That would be what is called separability. You are separating correctly the classes. Uh, but anyway, you don't need complete separability. You need just average separability. This to be positive. If this is positive, um, it turns out that um, rho dot is positive. You can see that, let's, let's take lambda to be very small, for instance, or rho very small. You can see that um, if the sum fn yn is positive, and fn is small, then fn square will be very small, and rho dot would be, would be positive. It turns out you can prove um, this is a little bit tricky. I can do it. But that if read rho dot is positive at some point, at some time, then rho dot would be positive delta t later. So rho will increase until it reaches an equilibrium point, a point in which rho dot is 0. And this would be this value. There are many equilibrium points, depending on the value of fn um, that you may have. What you find is that um, the, there will be a equilibrium point in which rho is smaller than other equilibrium points. And so and these are situations in which fn is close to 1 or minus 1. And, uh, and uh, for, in this case, rho will be relatively small. You can have other equilibrium points when fn is small, and then rho will be larger. And, uh, um, and the intuition is that when rho is larger, the fn can be quite small, and you have, it's easy to find many value of the weights that make the fn with larger rho fit the data. So the idea is, if you start from rho small at initialization, rho will grow if, if you get average separability at some point, and then you will get to an equilibrium with relatively small rho, and then you, then if you, um, if you perturb the system or do something else, you can go to higher value, more, or or if your, your initialization is large, um, your um, weight matrices are initialized in such a way that the row at initialization is bigger than this. Then you may, the row may decrease to go to this equilibrium if he does not find other ones on the way. Yeah, again, there was a very simple argument I gave you why small rho corresponds to large margin. Uh, you can see it directly to that equation. You know, suppose that uh, because there is a regularization parameter lambda, you don't exactly interpolate. Um, so the Fn is never exactly plus one or minus one. Um, but you can, um, you can see that uh, for small, very small rho, this is just to give the intuition, but it's for very small, for a very small lambda, you have, a, you have this situation, and uh, these are all approximation, but you get to something like this, where, F would be the average margin. 
Um, so if rho equilibrium grows, the margin decreases. Now, margin, you know, I, I can gi I will give you proof, but the intuition is that the margin is larger, you are farther away from the classification boundary, and that would be good for a, a, a low test error. It would be good for doing well on the test set. That's the whole idea of margin, also in support vector machines. Large margin is good for generalization. So this means that if you want to, um, if you want to have large margin, you should ideally find equilibria that have small rho. And one of the good first good thing to do in order to do this is to initialize the old system with small rho, because then rho will grow. Will grow, you can think it will grow, and exploring whether the, there are VK that fit the data, right? Let me skip this for now. I can come back later in the afternoon, but it's um, a simple version of this proof that if uh, rho dot is positive at some point will remain positive, um, and, uh, yeah, that's uh, just uh, what I said before about what you expect with small initialization. And here, just to show some experiments in which you can see that um, as you go through epochs, um, this is CIFAR, so you have, uh, uh, you have, uh, the test, the training error decreasing um, um, decreasing to essentially to zero or very small. Um, rho increases until it reaches an equilibrium. And the test, the error in test, in prediction, will decrease until also reaches a plateau. The, these experiments are, uh, oh no, the initialization is slightly different. So uh, 0 0.01 and 0 0.1 here is the norm. I think um, the total row at initialization. Anyway, not, not much is changing. And this is, uh, uh, if I have time, I'll show something else. When you have, uh, when you have batch norm and weight decay, you, what you find is rather independent of the initial conditions, unless, unless you start with very large initializations. If you don't have uh, weight decay or, and uh, uh, batch norm, then you have much more variability, dependence, you have much more dependence on initial conditions. Yeah. Those are a bit surprising because I would expect that the margin is larger, those would be higher, right? It's better, but it also be Well, the training loss is, you expect it to be not exactly zero, but essentially zero. Well, let's say, without weight decay, I would expect it to be zero. You know, think about, uh, it does not matter. You could have a very small margin you interpolate. This is classification, it's not regression. We are using square laws, which would suggest regression, but it's classification. So I could have exact interpolation and very small margin. It's an interesting situation, right? I have exact minimization. Lar relatively large row, small margin, small fn, interpolate the data, the loss is zero, and it's much worse than another one that does interpolation in the same way, zero loss, but has, um, you know, small row and large margin. So there is this small row, large margin, this, this um, property that row, if it starts to be 
to start to increase at some point early on, it will in continue to increase until an equilibrium. Um, I'll tell you more about there will be an equilibrium depending on the data that is the one which is the smallest row among the equilibria that, that, that exist. Um, and this is the one with the minimum norm because rho is the norm that we are for the solution. And uh, um, yeah, the, the, I'll show later that this one with the minimum norm is the one that has the best bound in terms of expected error. So the best one in terms of generalization. Um, yeah, it's interesting to observe that if lambda is equal to zero, you don't have weight decay, then you know the system is degenerate in the sense that the equation for V dot have these two terms. So I can have a critical point of V dot because I exactly fit the data. This is the first term, the first parenthesis, or because I normalize. That's a bit a strange degeneracy. With lambda bigger than zero, even a very tiny amount, then the first term will not interpolate. So will not be zero, be small, but not zero. And then the critical point of V dot will correspond to um, normalization, to the fact that V has norm one. So, Having a, a small weight decay is not so much to minimize the norm, but is to uh, avoid this degeneracy. And in practice, at least in some simple experiments I did, um, it looks like uh, this degeneracy contributes to uh, dependence of initial condition, to having sometimes a solution, sometimes not good solution. So I'll show that later, but again, in the case of lambda equals zero or very, very small, all the Fxn, if you are in a um, zero loss minimum, should be equal to plus one or minus one. And therefore, all the margin are the same for lambda equals zero. Um, that's important, I'll, I'll show later, for something called the neural collapse. That is an interesting feature of many uh, data set and algorithms for deep networks. Um, and we have also this uh, other property. I'll come back to this because this is essentially for neural collapse. So that, there are interesting properties that one can look from the dynamics and that are um, summarized here. So I'll repeat this um, uh, when I start again and then get into this neural collapse um, phenomenon that has been found uh, a few months ago. All right, so I'll finish the, the morning in the afternoon and then do the afternoon part in the rest of the afternoon. In the meantime, yeah, buon appetito for lunch. <laughs>